Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, just as we begin, uh, you know, to introduce myself, I'm Stefan Berg Kruger, head of the data strategy team at Parsons TKO. Um, Parsons TKO, we are the engagement architects. As an organization, we pride ourselves in our ability to think through the experiences mission driven organizations need to create for their audiences to help accomplish their goals. A lot of our approach to this is what we call engagement architecture. So engagement architecture is the Parsons TKO philosophy and the methodology that helps everyone stitch together their strategy, the people within and externally, the processes that they use and the platforms that they use to create those experiences for those audiences and drive meaningful lasting engagement. Of course, through all of this, there is the layer of data, um, the, the area that I specialize in and that my team specializes in data is a, a sort of a lifeblood for a lot of these these components of engagement architecture that helps us stitch it together help stitch together the experiences and and that data can be used to build and to, to optimize new kinds of experiences for our audiences a lot of those richer experiences end up taking the form of campaigns campaigns are the way in which we organize these experiences for our audiences. And so really thinking through all of these elements of engagement architecture, I introduced this not just because it's how we introduce ourselves, but because a lot of these concepts are gonna be particularly important today as we talk about the role of data in creating new and creative and impactful kinds of campaigns. So the topic of the day, impactful campaigns, the marriage of data and creativity. What we're gonna talk through is the role that data plays in help helping to shape not just the experiences of the campaigns itself but really to shape the way we as organizations as communications and pr professionals engage with the process of creating that it's changing the way we work uh, in with the goal of, of creating more impactful experiences for our audiences so just to talk through the agenda a little bit, how we're gonna be spending our time. Um, first, I wanna talk a little bit big picture principles and, and goals of, of data, the ways in which we should think about data and campaigns. And then we're gonna get a bit into some of the, the nitty gritty details, examples of how we can work with data in the campaign process. We'll wrap up with uh, a couple of stories, um, you know, examples and sort of illustrations of what it looks like, what things can be accomplished once you've successfully integrated data into your campaign planning process and campaign execution process. Um, and I am optimistic. It's uh, I've got a bunch of slides, but I'm optimistic we can go fast enough to have some time for Q and A at the end. Um, so please don't be shy, use the chat box, um, ask the questions as we go, and we will do our best to catch up with those uh, at the end of the presentation. Recognizing that we might be cutting it a bit close, um, I also just wanted to offer to everyone here that I will hold office hours immediately after this webinar. So if anyone has uh, time in the next hour uh, and you wanna hang back after class, uh, I would love to continue the conversation and, and talk a bit more personally uh, with anyone who can stay about their own circumstances and, uh, and their own questions. So that's the big picture there. Now I wanna start off thinking about campaigns, thinking about data and using sort of proverbial um, uh, lessons that we can bring into this process. And the first thing I will say is that the best proverbs are either true or relevant. Um, uh, not always both. So, uh, so it goes for, for Proverbs, so it goes for a lot of the lessons I'm gonna share today. We are all coming from very different circumstances. There is no one size fits all solution to using data in campaigns. So hear me out as we go through this, but really think about your own context. Think about your own organization, your own ability to shape and build campaigns your own data resources that you already have access to. There are going to be lessons that need to be modified to be used well in your organization. But I will also say that my advice is as relevant as you make it. These ideas are going to be instructive, 
but the actual success of data and campaigns comes from behavior change. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about some of the things that I'd like to see people in the nonprofit sector doing. Uh, and I really encourage you all as we go through to think about your organizations, think about what you can change about the way you run campaigns. Next up is storytelling. Storytelling is a topic that comes up a lot in communications, comes up a lot in campaign planning, and, and comes a lot up a lot in, in the context of data. And I think it's important to reframe the way people often think about and talk about storytelling. Storytelling is not about you telling your story. It's about finding your place in your audience's story. Storytelling is a, an empathetic activity. We need to understand the context of the people who we are talking to. And this is gonna be true in content creation. It's a you know, well, well studied and well understood uh, role of, uh, of, of content creation. It's gonna be true in how we think about the, the stories that we wanna put into our campaigns, but it's especially true with data and it remains true with data. And a lot of people think data, data itself is, you know, it stands alone, it, it is its own solution. Data works when it can be applied to people in your organization to help those people make better decisions. So understanding your audience's context is important for storytelling, and that remains true for your internal audiences. How do the people on your team plan campaigns and execute campaigns, and how can you use data to help shape their mindset and help shape the decisions they make in that process? That's what's gonna end up with a new type of campaign. The next thing to talk about is data and analytics. Analytics is more than practicing a technical skill. Analytics is a management philosophy. Analytics and, uh, and data strategy, as, uh, as we more commonly refer to it, analytics is, is a, a way of using data to, again, shape those decisions in the organization. It's a way of using data and its convening power to help bring your team together, to help shape and spark conversations that lead to new strategies, that lead to new tactics in a campaign, that lead to new ideas about the way we use our platforms, new ideas about the way we create content and, and string together um, those experiences. Campaigns are how we organize content, but campaigns are also how we create unified audience experiences. And that, that is a, a, a cognitive flip that I think a lot of organizations struggle to make. You know, a lot of organizations see their campaigns from the perspective of the campaign producers. We are in our organizations, we are in our Word docs, in our Google docs, and we are hammering out content day after day. We experience campaigns from the producer's side, and that's often how we end up seeing them. Um, you know, I think, you know, being flippant about it, people have a blog and therefore campaigns are about creating new blogs that they can push out to people. And that's a little bit divorced from what our audiences actually need. So it, it can be a trap to look at what our audiences can do and focus on that to the exclusion of what's missing and what our audiences need and what we can do for our audiences to help bring their story together and help curate that experience for their own personal context. And so thinking about campaigns in this way and, and really pushing the campaign and the experience of the campaign outside of the organization, it's not something that you produce, it's something that people outside have and you need to tap into. That's really bringing together those ideas of storytelling, putting yourselves into their context, and then also using data to understand that context and make sure that we are creating something unique and relevant for each of those people. So how do people experience campaigns? I think, you know, the, in the ideal world, we often imagine content consumption and our audiences, how do they engage with us? We imagine it looks a little bit like this. You know, people go to their happy place, they get comfortable, they are there with the intent and the purpose and the goal of consuming our content and, and they are going to enjoy it. And they're gonna sit there and really read it and understand it. 
But in reality, your audience's experience of your content and your campaigns probably looks a bit more like this. They are on their way somewhere else. They are doing something else. They're on their way home. And they're in this crowded context. Their life is packed. And, and they have probably just a few moments. And they're probably not you know, really curled up in consuming your campaign. They're probably just flipping through notifications on their phone. And, and you really need to understand the complexity, the nuance, the different contexts that your audiences are coming from to make sure that you are being succinct enough, compelling enough, and changing your relevance to that context. Because you might have some people like this, but you're also gonna have a lot of people like this. And how can you tell the difference? And how can you make sure that you're giving the right experience to the right person at the right time? So that's a, that's a, a big set of the, the, the principles that I wanna make sure we focus on. Now, putting it fairly bluntly, I'm gonna ask you to change your behaviors. I'm gonna ask you to change the way your, your organization plans campaigns and runs campaigns and does things. And in particular, some of the things that I hope you will reflect on as we go through the rest of the webinar today is experience planning. How do you conduct experience planning in your organization? In, including how do you actually see it? How do you, how do you design it? What does that experience look like? Your campaign calendar, really thinking through what is the schedule of, of a campaign? And, and what are campaigns? What do you build campaigns around? How much of your content just goes out as an isolated blip without really being connected to the rest of an experience? And how can we either pull that back and loop it into something that's a broader experience or how can, we, how can we really put together a, uh, uh, an experience for a new piece of content that you've, you've just put, put out into the world? Another thing a lot of organizations are gonna need to focus on is documentation. How do you keep track of everything that you have in terms of content, campaign experiences, but also data? How do we understand what data we have and how it can be used and how it is relevant? There's gonna be changes in how you use your tools as well. What is the actual experience of using your tool to configure a campaign? What is the experience of using your tool to conduct segmentation and targeting? And do you have the right time invested in that? Do you have the right talent on your team to, to use those capabilities? Do you have the right tools? Uh, and, and often, yes, I think a lot of tools go underutilized. But sometimes you will find you're going to need to introduce something else in order to make the rest of your tools work. So keeping an open mind about those changes and the way we work with our platforms. But I think last and certainly not least is the way that you work with your peers and how you spend your time. People are the engines of nonprofit organizations. How we spend our time in these organizations determines the outputs, determines the outcomes, determines the experiences that we create. And in a lot of cases, the, the more elevated and impactful campaigns are gonna require coordination across different people, across different departments. Um, there may be historical lines and divisions between some of these, and I'm really gonna encourage people to break those down. How do we make sure that we are bringing everyone who can bring expertise and everyone who can do something to change the audience experience together to help find those opportunities and, and make those changes? So we're going to start getting into some of the more practical and tactical parts of this story. Um, but I do want to offer, we've, uh, we've put together a, a worksheet uh, to go with the rest of this webinar. Um, if, uh, if you would like to, I think you will find the link in the chat momentarily. Um, this is a, it's a bingo card. So this is a, a form that will follow along with the rest of the presentation. And it will give us a sense of um, what things you might learn. And it will give you a place to capture your reflections as we go through the rest of the topic. Uh, so the link has just gone into the chat there. So if uh, you open up the chat, you should see the link. Uh, I invite you to follow along. It's not required, um, but hopefully makes it a bit easier um, to, to take notes as we go forward. All right. 
So what's next? How should we think about campaign data? We're gonna talk through a few of the different lenses that we use to think about and talk about data. Um, again, today is about campaigns. And so, uh, you know, ultimately of these different approaches, we're gonna focus on campaign process. Um, but I wanted to just talk through engagement architecture as a lens and data operations as a lens to, to think about and understand your data. Um, because having that understanding will help you figure out how to use it in a campaign context. So first and foremost, engagement architecture. We talked about it at the beginning of the presentation, but it is a way of understanding all the elements of your organization that contribute to your experiences, your audience experiences, your campaign experiences. Uh, and, and they are also where your data lives. Um, uh, you know, your data lives in your platforms. Your website has its own data internally. Uh, a lot of the experience of the website gets captured in your analytics tool like Google Analytics. You have an email platform that almost certainly holds and harvests a lot of what your audiences are doing with you and with your content. Um, and that may or may not sync cleanly with a separate CRM where you also keep and maintain history with your audiences. There's social media, there's your donation platform, there's your event platform and so on and so forth. There's association management platforms. There's all kinds of platforms in your organization and all of them hold little bits of those experiences. So when we're thinking about campaign data, it's useful to make sure we understand this whole context and where you can find those little bits of data. But then we also need to figure out how that connects to the rest of your engagement architecture. How can we understand your data in the context of your strategies and your tactics? in the context of a campaign strategy and really finding the connection between the goal of a particular campaign, let's say for example, uh, uh, you know, it's a thought leadership campaign and you wanna demonstrate your expertise to would-be donors or would-be partners um, and making sure that we understand which metrics connect to that, which metrics like scroll depth or time on page are the right ones for the type of content that you are producing for the goal of thought leadership. And then of course, there's also the stakeholders who are the people in your organization who are responsible for these platforms, responsible for the experiences they support, and who are the people who are able to help get those data out and also get the lessons out of that data and bring those lessons and bring those ideas and then actually turn that data back around and put it back into your engagement architecture in a new and useful way. Making sure that we have the right data, we can find it, we understand where it can be used, we can understand how it can be moved back and forth and, and leveraged in support of campaigns. The next lens that we use to talk about data most often is data operations. How do we understand the state, the health, the maturity of our data platform? How do we understand the capabilities that data can support? Which outreach capabilities, which analysis capabilities, and who leads which data practices? Again, to that point about stakeholders in your engagement architecture, you have different people in your organization who are more or less expert in different parts of your data practice. And there are also people who need to be consumers of those data practices, who are the people who need to receive the right lessons. And then how do we make sure that we are collecting the data that all of those practices and processes need? So really understanding those data practices and the business processes that are related to your data. And the, the sort of four stages that we use to talk about data operations is the strategy definition, both what are we trying to accomplish as an organization? What's the mission? What's the goal of the campaign? But then also what is the strategy for the data itself? For each data point that you collect, what is its purpose? What is its role? Uh, these are important things to think about from being successful with data, uh, but also from things like compliance considerations, uh, making sure that you are using data responsibly, that you are collecting it ethically, that you are in compliance with the varying and multiplying laws around the world. So really having that strategy pinned down is, is crucial. The tracking component is probably what we most often think about. Um, being able to collect data that is useful and relevant, 
sometimes it's not even a question of collecting a new type of data, but just making sure that you have the right context on that data. You can gather a whole bunch of information about page views and those can be useful, but only if you know which piece of content received each page view or which program in your organization received each page view. Making sure that that tracking is working correctly for your purposes and your campaign purposes is, uh, is another important piece. Reporting is different than tracking. When you track data, it often ends up living in a database or a research tool. That doesn't mean that it's in the right format for people to use. And so making sure that we think about what it looks like to turn the data into insights is a, is a separate activity. And then lastly, the adoption and optimization. That's that piece that I, I talked about before, how we spend our time and what we actually do with the data. Do we commit to being consumers of our own insights? And, uh, and using data to both change the way we think and meet and work together, and then actually turn that data back around and plug it back into campaigns in, in the form of things like segmentation, in the form of things like personalization. So those are, are operationally some of the things to think about. What I'm gonna talk about for probably about the next 20 minutes uh, is the campaign process itself. So here we are getting to the, the meat of the matter. In the campaign process, we have these four, sorry, six rather, um, six major stages of campaign operations where data can play a, an important part. There's planning, targeting, optimizing, evaluating, demonstrating, and recording. So through all of this campaign process, we are looking for how data can lead to better outcomes. How can we use data to change what the campaign accomplishes? What are the right formats at different points? How deep or shallow should we go in, in different stages of campaign process? And then when should you use the data? Um, there are time, there's a timeline in campaigns of when the data is relevant and useful and when it's too late. And, and it's not worth digging up anymore because the opportunity to use it has passed. So those are gonna be some important considerations here. So let's dive into some of these ideas. The first, another proverb, how do you create a good user experience with a good campaign management experience? Again, the experiences your audience will have flow from the people in your organization and the work that they do. So if you want to make sure that you have a good external experience, make sure that the people who you have creating those experiences have everything they need, are well supported, are given the opportunity to be creative, are given the opportunity to discover new ways of creating engaging experiences. So that's a lot of what we're focusing on are these, these internal parts of what you do. To, to create the space. Because again, there's not one campaign model. The right campaign is gonna vary tremendously organization to organization. So the, the, the most general advice I can give is know thyself and really think through the people who are creating these experiences and what they need at each step of the process. So again, those six steps, there's really kind of split up in terms of what you do with data across these six steps and when they are going to help your organization. The first three, planning, targeting, and optimizing are the ones that you can use for any one particular campaign. Those are ways for in the moment campaign that's launching next week or next month. These are steps you can do to make sure that campaign works and is successful. The other three, evaluating, demonstrating, and recording, those are investments in the future. Every campaign gives you the opportunity to do, these, to do these things, to grow your organization's campaign capabilities, but they are for the future. And that's why they're often dismissed. They're often discarded, but they are a tremendous opportunity. They, are, they give you the lasting impact. Those first three don't give you lasting impact. They help this campaign and you're gonna have to do it again for the next campaign. But those other three, those last three, four, five, and six, those are investments in your team. Those are investments in your future. They are tremendously valuable, but too easily discarded. So that's one thing I wanna really encourage is that everyone make time, not just for the best of these, but for all six of these in order to truly leverage your data 
to improve your campaign capability. So talking through one at a time, first comes planning. And this is where a lot of the you know, user experiencers out there uh, are going to, to see their own you know, exposure to the process uh, and, and really you know, thinking through the, create, the creative opportunities. What are the, the ways in which we can come up with something new or different? This is, it's the blank canvas. It's the stage in the campaign where anything is possible and you are not yet constrained by the realities of what you have and what you can do. This is the goal setting process. For this process, some things that are really valuable are having the right content at your fingertips, understanding what you already have so you don't necessarily always need to recreate it. Um, again, I, I made the reference before to people have a blog and therefore they write blog posts, often forgetting that they might already have a piece of content that's just as good as the new thing they're gonna write. And your campaign consumers have not read every single one of your blog posts. And so making sure that you, you have your content and your history as an asset that you can reference, that you can use, that you can bring back in to enrich an experience so that you can curate an experience for them. That content library is tremendously useful. How many of us have you know, had the conversation, oh yeah, yeah, we've got something like that. And you go rushing to the Q drive uh, or you go rushing into your folders in Google Drive and you're trying to remember what you need to type in the search box to find that perfect thing. Having your content well-structured, well-organized is so valuable to the creative process and the planning process of a campaign. So whether that's something like a digital asset management platform, you know, sort of a formal, you know, a new platform for you uh, to help manage that. But sometimes it's as simple as, let's just look at the top performing things in Google Analytics. Um, but again, what does performing mean? And again, are there subsets of that? Do you want to be able to filter your content, uh, you know, and the performance of your content by a certain topic, for example? And do you have your data structured in a way? So building that sort of content research experience one way or another is gonna be a way to help you plan faster and include more value in your campaigns. The next one I wanna harp on is audience personas. A lot of us have them. They are a very tried and true and longstanding tradition in user experience and campaign design. A lot of audience personas are rooted in the theoretical process of user experience design. Uh, if you think about your audience personas and there's a, a picture of a person named Mia and you know about her pets, that is very helpful. It's a helpful mental tool, but it is often so divorced from your data and the reality of your engagement architecture that it's actually hard to use in the actual campaign planning process. So I really encourage you to rethink and modernize the approach to audience personas to be more rooted in data. How does this persona, how does an influencer, how does a donor represent itself in our platforms, in our data? Platform by platform, really think it through. What are the experiences? What are the, the data flags that they will throw off that help us recognize them? The more data relevant your personas are, the easier they will be to use to design segments, to conduct targeting. Uh, and, and that's a, you know, a really, really valuable way to, to make the planning process more actionable. Lastly here, there is audience research based on search and social media. This is a big one for me. Um, search data in particular, social media as well, are woefully underutilized. Um, these are both platforms and environments where the audiences we are trying to reach telling us with their own fingers, you know, typing into, into boxes uh, on various websites, what they are looking for, what they want, what they're interested in. We have reams and reams of this data hiding in different dashboards, things like Google Search Console and Twitter is a, you know, sort of the most famous one in the social listening space because of how open it is. It's just sitting there waiting for us to look at it and draw conclusions. So there's a lot that you can do in audience research using these data sets. Um, th those are things that I, I would really encourage everyone to invest more in. Targeting. 
So once you know what your campaign is going to accomplish, you need to go through the actual steps of configuring your platforms to execute this targeting. How do we make sure that we are sending the right content to the right person? And I think a little bit, a little bit at odds with the planning process, which is by its nature, usually pretty collaborative. It often looks like this, you know, people gathered around talking about possibilities. The targeting becomes very isolated very quickly because you usually have one person who's responsible for each platform and they go in there and they click the buttons and do the configuration uh, to make sure that your ads or your email segments um, are, are getting set up uh, you know, in a way that gets the, the right content to the right people. This is something I, I wanna shake up a little bit. Um, you are gonna have your platform experts, but I wanna make sure that this targeting process is a little bit more circular, is a little bit more back and forth. And so we need to help one another understand the unique targeting capabilities of each channel. Uh, you know, Facebook in particular is in, incredibly nuanced. You can, you can target someone on a particular street corner. You can target someone who's been engaged for three months. Um, there's, there's no end to how specific you can get with the targeting in some of these platforms. Um, others like email, you can target as well as you have data to target. But the capabilities, the ability to do that targeting are fairly unrestricted, even on a lot of the, the, the platforms that nonprofits have access to. So making sure we understand what's possible and can teach one another in our organizations what's possible so that we can then have these conversations about, okay, well, I know this in my platform. So if I teach yours about the experience that we had with our audience, then you can you know, sub-segment and, and send a, a different message uh, to that audience that'll, that'll help them be more successful. So understanding the capabilities and then the data that we have available. And that's where something like a data catalog really becomes important. We ourselves are as platform experts often know what data we have and what is good data, what's healthy data, what's uh, enough data, uh, but we need to be able to communicate that to one another and, and, and figure out the possibilities, but also the responsible uses of that data. And lastly, being realistic, um, we need to be able to understand the limitations of our targeting. Um, you know, we can't do everything for everyone and we can't make sure that exactly the right people. And so being tolerant of some of those edges of, uh, you know, how, how specific we can be and understanding that it, imperfection is okay. You know, there's a lot of room for error in these experiences. Again, people aren't going to be sitting there uh, you know, going through every single, you know, message that you put out to, to figure out if everything was specifically meant for them. Um, there's, there's a lot of tolerance on the part of our audiences. And so it's okay to be ambitious with the recognition that you might miss some things at the edges. Um, that making space for that ambition is, uh, is, uh, is an important thing, especially that leaders can do uh, to help make their teams feel confident with experimentation and targeting. Next up is optimizing. This is what we do once the campaign has begun. And, and again, thinking about the experience of this optimization, um, once the campaign is running, you don't usually have time to sit around and you know, be thoughtful and do research. Uh, it often looks a bit more like this. You are on your way home from work and something's happened, new data has just come in, and we got to make a snap decision right there on the street corner because the team needs time to maneuver in the middle of a campaign. So some things we can do to help prepare ourselves for this part, uh, this optimizing part, is giving yourself a clear sense at the beginning of the process of what are the alternative paths for a campaign? What is the other piece of content you can post? What are the messages that you can change the schedule on? Some, push something out sooner or swap the order of it. And then what are the triggers? What do you need to see to know that it's time to change course? And having that playbook for your campaign right at the beginning will let you be nimble. That is what makes data powerful, is creating opportunities for your tactics to change based on the data. Without those options, if you don't have options in your strategy, then there's no point to the data because you're not gonna do anything different. 
So, so this is a really important piece is, uh, is creating those pathways. Building a reliable reporting pipeline and or process is, is, is another thing that makes it possible because you can have the options, but you need the ability to, to get the data, you know, to know whether you've tripped the trigger to change course. I, I say pipeline and or process. Um, pipeline makes it sound fancy. That's, you know, something like a dashboard. Things are automatically calculated. You can check really quick. A lot of your tools have this built into them already, but process is just as important. You just need to know who on my team is going to go check. Who's, who's going to tell us? Who, who is watching at the different points in the campaign when we need to know is it time to change course? So having that schedule you know, put into your campaign calendar, these are the moments when we need to check. These are the moments when we need to decide. This is how much time we need to make those decisions. So that's, uh, that's going to be a, a really powerful part of this in operationalizing data in the middle of a campaign. And recognizing these constraints, let's also be very clear about how thorough data is in this context, in the optimizing context. You're not going to have time to write the big report. You're not going to want to wait until the next quarterly comes out four months from now to know whether or not the campaign that's happening this week is going well enough or doing what you expected. So these communications about data are going to be informal. A Slack message is a great data and analytics report for the middle of a campaign, just to give people enough to know, okay, I think we should do something different um, and, and to give a space for, for those conversations to happen. So at this point, the campaign has ended. I think we've talked through the opportunities to drive the campaign itself. Next, we want to get into evaluating. Evaluating the campaign is a thing that you do internally, and it is for your people. You use your data to make your people and your process better. Your people first, because the people are the mechanism for creativity in most organizations, and in, in all organizations, just for now, at least. Um, and and having the opportunity for your team to come together and to meet and think about what just happened in the campaign is the best time to extract the lessons. Never again will your team know as much about how a particular campaign went than right around the end of that campaign. And so we need to make sure that we create that space. Put the retrospective on the calendar as soon as you know the campaign is coming. Do, don't let it get run over because the longer you wait, the less you're gonna know and the less you're gonna be able to keep in the organization about that experience of creating this experience. This is also a great opportunity to democratize hypotheses. What are the questions that you wanna ask of your data? Your data, again, it's just a bunch of numbers sitting in a table. It's the creativity and questions that bring to the data that leads to interesting insights. And your team has different experiences. They have different expertise. They saw different parts of the campaign unfold. So making sure that you get all those questions is how you turn your data into the stories that will help people change the way they think about the experiences they want to create next time. And that, that last point there, looking for the small data, the surprises, good and bad in the experience. One of the the projects that we're doing right now is, is focused on, on um, the user experience of, of you know, very particular parts of a, of a website and having things like session recordings where you can go in and you can see what a person's mouse does. There's, you know, it's anecdotal data, but it's extremely powerful and helping to illustrate to yourself, to your peers, what does it actually look like to go through this experience? And you need the space to look at that together. You need the space to understand what, what the, the experience of your campaigns are so that you can change them in the future. Demonstrating the impact of your campaigns is, if there's one thing that usually happens after a campaign, it's this, especially in the context where the campaign was supported by leadership or an outside donor or a foundation. This process of demonstrating is, it is very much an art form. There's a, if you, if you go look up uh, the definition of analytics, 
um, analytics is the discovery and communication of meaningful patterns in data. Demonstrating impact is all about that communication piece. This is where we are using data to tell a story about how well we did or didn't do. And you need to understand the context of the people you are trying to tell about with your data. And so is this gonna happen in a boardroom and you need something that's really thorough or is it happening in a bar and you are just you know, talking to the people you need to convince or impress about the performance of your campaign? In which case you just need bullet points in your head and you need the talking points, you need the stories. This is a very narrative driven process. Um, uh, for the most part, if, if it's useful and effective, it's going to be narrative driven. Because again, you are convincing people and storytelling is the right format for that. So there's a lot of curation that goes into demonstrating. You need to make sure you're pulling together the right pieces of data, the right outcomes of your campaign to create the story of what you've accomplished. And then probably take another crack at it again, because you probably know too much about what happened. And so how can you really make sure that you're telling the right story about what you accomplished, about what you accomplished and about the opportunities that it created for the next campaign, the next step in what your organization is trying to accomplish. And as you do this, as you think about the data, as you look at the data and try to turn it into a performance report, remember that the numbers represent human experience. How can you talk about the data in the context of what people went through as they experienced the campaign. If having things like screenshots, it sounds simple, but it really makes such a big difference to really helping people see it. Okay, this is what it looked like. This is what you put our audiences through. And, and that really helps bring it home and helps people be thoughtful and creative about what they wanna do next time. And then lastly here is recording. Recording the data from your campaign, but also recording the lessons from your campaign are going to make them available and useful again in the future. I, I cannot emphasize enough how important this piece is. This is how your organization builds its memory. This is how your organization is able to develop long-term relationships with people systemically. You as individuals, if you're doing one-on-one -on -one outreach, if you're in government relations or donor relations, you're very good at building your one-on-one -on -one relationships with people. But your audiences aren't always gonna be talking to you. Very often, they don't think about the organization as just you. They expect the organization to also have a relationship with them. Recording data from campaigns is the way that you do that. So you need to be clear about what you will do with your data. I think, you know, again, to that compliance point, before we are, we are making a building a relationship, and there's there's a contract uh, that we have with our audiences about why we need to know things about them, and making sure that you understand the future use cases is going to help you fulfill that that contract, fulfill those promises, and build that relationship, and it's going to help you figure out what data you need to be collecting. At the end of each campaign. There's the point where that data can either float away into obscurity or you can harness it. And so that can mean migrating your campaign data into a system of record if that's not happening automatically already. Or sometimes it's, it's putting that data into a system of action. You know, how can, we, how can we move an experience from offline events into our email system so that we can make sure we're getting the right materials out, the right follow-up. Um, and having those, uh, those tools in place is, is going to be very important. And putting those lessons in your institutional memory is, uh, is the next and the, the last piece of this, is making sure that the data, but then also the, the lessons, the things that came out of the uh, evaluating process, how can we actually make sure that these stories are available to us again when we're trying to do the next one? How many times do we have to recreate the wheel and come up with the same experience again, campaign after campaign. And so this is a, a really big piece of, uh, of making sure that those stories live on in the organization. So those were the, the six steps of the campaign process and examples of how we can use data in those steps. I'm gonna talk fairly quickly now through a couple, couple little vignettes, sort of examples, what it, what it kind of looks like, um, how we can think about and visualize the, the 
impact, the effect of using data in campaigns. Uh, so these are just a few stories, but I hope they, they help illustrate that for you. Again, we just finished talking about the reporting process and how it supports long-term relationships. Long-term relationships are the foundation of some of the most impactful interactions that we have with our audiences. Our campaigns sometimes internally try to build people up to that point, but often they're, the campaign itself is just one step in a much longer story. Data is our memory as an organization. Data is what your organization remembers about the people who engage with you. How people are supposed to grow as individuals through the campaign is a, is a big question that we have to ask ourselves in the planning process to make sure that we're, we're giving the experience to facilitate that growth. But then it's also really helpful to know whether or not you were successful. It's important to know who actually made it through those steps so that they had the, 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 the change in thought leadership, the change in thinking, the change in the way your audience interacts or, or views the world, depending on, on what you're trying to accomplish. And then helping to make sure that your audience is, is successfully completing those actions and then also being rewarded or at least recognized for, for the actions that they take. And a lot of times we're asking our, we're asking our audiences to, to do things. We're asking them to change their behaviors. Um, these, are, these are big commitments we're sometimes asking for. And so they're gonna wanna know that, that you recognize that. And that data is, is again, likely at first at least scattered throughout your engagement architecture. And so making sure that we are, are retaining that and then using it again down the road. And this is a bit of what, what that looks like. You know, you can think through the first touch that you have with someone, um, the fact that you might have, you know, near-term follow-ups, they might attend an event, they might have signed up for a newsletter, but you're just starting to build history. And the more that happens, the more often that they, um, you know, participate in a conversation online or, or are consuming content, can you use that to start to understand who is this person? What are they interested in? Um, what are their preferred content formats? And, and building that understanding, it's, it's not the individual data points, it's recognizing the trends in those data points and then saving those trends as something that you know about this contact, this person. And then as they start to become more active, they're not just passively consuming, but they're actually doing things, they're actually um, uh, helping to deliver on the mission in, in some form or fashion, they're donating, they're signing petitions, they're uh, you know, helping to register and volunteer. Uh, you know, these are things that we need to make sure that we recognize and, and understand. And that's what give us, gives us, as individually sometimes, but more importantly, as an organization, the ability to, to see communities of people. These are our power users. Um, and, and this is a, a community that we can serve quickly. We don't need to send out an all staff email and say, hey, everyone, tell me who are the best people for us to invite to the gala. We know as an organization, we can go straight to it. and We can build that gala experience, the many step, the invitations, the, the subsequent follow-up messages. We can build that outreach as an organization well ahead of time um, with, with a lot less friction in the, in the experience creation process. And again, this is something we've alluded to, but just thinking through all those many steps, the different types of things that people do throughout, um, the fact that reading content early in a relationship can tell you a lot about what is compelling. You know, if you know, based on your organizational taxonomy, this person is always reading about green roofs. That's what really matters to them. When it comes to asking them to take action, when it comes to asking them to contribute their own expertise, you know this is a person we can talk to. This is a person that we can deploy as an influencer. This is a person who will carry this idea forward for us and, and we, can, we can depend on them to help accomplish the organizational mission. So a lot of that was about the, the small data, you know, what is the very personal things that we can do with individuals to build relationships. But this, these principles also apply to the, the mass market, uh, you know, outreach that we do. Use your audience's words to choose the words that you use to reach your audiences. It sounds simple, but it's something that we often overlook. 
we know so much about our, our entire audience based on things like search data and social listening. We can go and see how they talk. We can go and see how these communities form around ideas. And then we can use that to design our own outreach. And so helping to figure out where do we align or misalign with the community that we're trying to reach can change your editorial strategy. It can change the way or the types of content or the, the frequency of content or recognize that you already have the right content. You've already mastered um, the words that they use, but, but how do you know? How do you know which of your content is most closely aligned with, uh, with what your audience is doing? So, so thinking through these things and getting ahead of the need, making sure that you have this knowledge internally so that you can use it in your, uh, in your outreach is, is, is extremely powerful. And you know, the, the power here is akin to what, what organizations often spend a lot of money and a lot of time on doing full market research studies, going out and conducting interviews and, and doing surveys. Um, these are resource intensive processes that will often tell you probably more or at least different things, but a similar amount of value to what you already have just sitting in databases. Uh, and so this is a, an extremely powerful use of data um, that uh, I really want people to, to explore. And what does it look like afterwards? Once you've gotten those insights, you can bring that back and you can apply those lessons that you learn from one type of analysis often to a lot of different outreach disciplines. So that same audience research process can be used not just to improve SEO, using search data to improve SEO is powerful and you know, often underutilized um, and can get you a lot, but you can bring those same lessons to an advertising campaign and often multiply your outreach and multiply your reach and your impact by as much budget as you have to throw at it. Um, it is a really effective way to improve targeting uh, across different channels, including social media, changing the way you talk on social media, helping find new people on social media. So one analysis can be used in many parts of the ecosystem. So what should I do now? I think there are five things based on this that I would encourage people to consider whether you have done. And if you haven't, please do think about doing it. Build the data inventory, figure out what you actually have, what can you use, what can you deploy on your campaigns. This will mean a conversation, talk around the building, what do we have? Um, really, really making sure you understand the landscape of data in your engagement architecture. Audience analysis. Whether that's changing your personas or whether that's conducting a, a, an analysis of your search, your social data, or doing a market research study, let's refine and rethink what we know about our audiences as we reframe our strategies around data. We need to really think through the experiences that we're trying to create and how they will change. Think through how you will use data to change your campaigns, to change those experiences. And all of these things will take a commitment of time and attention. You know, show me on your calendar where you're going to do this. Uh, you know, show me on your agenda. How are you changing the agenda of your existing editorial meeting to start incorporating data? How are you changing the agenda of your campaign, campaign planning meetings to make space for this? How are you changing the agenda of your retrospectives to give people a mandate to think about and use data? Really across all of this, challenge yourselves. Think about what you can do differently. Think about uh, the current, current content creation processes, the current behaviors that you have, and whether data can reaffirm or refute what you are doing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, really, really looking for opportunities to change what we do. And last but not least, I do want to put out a plug, a call to action um, for, for our own services. A lot of what we described here is what Parsons TKO does. Um, I think, you know, thinking about that first step, the data inventories, uh, one of the classes of project that we do are data appraisals. So if you think your organization needs help figuring out what they have and what they can accomplish with the data that they already have, please reach out and let us know. These are things that we can help with. And with that, I have uh, I've gotten to the end and left uh, Nary three minutes for, for questions. Um, and once again, we are going to have 
uh, uh, well, there's a survey coming out in the chat. Um, and we're also going to have office hours immediately after this. We will put a link uh, that's going to be in a separate Zoom room, uh, but I will head over there in a couple minutes. Um, but uh, in, in the two minutes we have left, um, I will thank you all and then uh, see if we had any questions come in that I might be able to answer very quickly. Um, yes, so we had a question from Susan Patterson. Um, that was our first question of, of a specific example of how to data eyes your uh, audience personas. Excellent. Yes, um, data ising. I like I like that phrasing. Um, so when you think about your audience personas, um, one of the things the closest I usually see audience personas get is keywords. What are some keywords this person will use? Um, but that keyword term is is a little vague. Um, you know, what is that keyword on social media? What is that keyword in Google search? What is that keyword? in internal site search if they're getting lost. The way people talk, the way people use language will change based on the experience. So as you're looking at your audience persona, bring up your map of your engagement architecture, bring up all the places where you have data and just go, bring up your data inventory, go data point by data point. Is there a way we can recognize this person here? If this person fits behavior X, Y, Z, if this person has consumed and read and downloaded 10 PDFs, they are in our academic wonk category. You know, we are really strictly defining audiences by data that we have available to us. Thank you. And uh, I think we have time for one more. Um, what suggestions do you have for small organizations without a designated content creator or data person? What's the best thing to prioritize? Um, everyone should have a little time for data. Data tells us what we're doing. Data tells us how we're working. I, I know that. I, I have been that person. Um, you know, wearing, um, you know, I, I, I learned about all this back in the days when it wasn't digital, it was new media. Uh, and, uh, and, and data is the only thing that is available to somebody like that to help them understand which of their choices, which of their activities are effective. So find time on your calendar. Um, put a block on your calendar to take a walk and breathe the air and relax and put another block on your calendar to even just sit and think about how do I know if what I'm doing is the right thing and what data can I look at? You use a lot of platforms. If you're in a small organization, you probably touch more platforms than somebody at a large organization does. Large organizations have one person per platform. You touch them all. All of those have little data platforms, little data dashboards, just spend time with them and, and really think through what questions you can ask of each of your platforms. Uh, that process alone will teach you so much, even before you look at any of the data. All right, and with that, I know we're at time. Um, so thank you all very much, Nardas, I think as Jess, or Lisa, thank you, has put the, the survey in the chat. Um, please fill out the survey and we're gonna put a link to office hours in there momentarily. Uh, and anyone who'd like to stay and keep talking, I'll, I'll see you there.